how do we take ourselves away from this is all there is? If you shout when, you, when you're angry, if you withdraw emotionally when you're jealous, if you tell people how wrong they are and try to change their lives when you're righteous, that's not you. We have a sense that we are more than minds and bodies, that the world in which we are living is more than random. You have been making those choices, and so there is a, an energy, a frequency about you that makes you a tugboat. When you change the love and fear in you, in that moment, you change the world. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to live out of love at a higher co-creative vibration, then do we have the Universal Human show for you. Today I'll be talking with Gary Zukov, the runaway best-selling author of Seed of the Soul, about his latest masterpiece, Universal Human. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about creating authentic power, living from a place of love, and raising your vibration to a much higher level. That plus we'll talk about the mothership of the soul, authentic humans, multi-sensory human beings, sex in San Francisco, and the A-team and an awakening and what that has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Gary. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready, Michael. If I'm not shining already, thank you for that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! And you are shining bright. And I'm so glad you're joining me here today. You're in Ashland, Oregon. I'm just outside of Mount Sopris in Colorado, where I'm interested in how the internet will work with a large thunderstorm just off my left shoulder. But with that said, before we dive right into things, what was the A team you were on? And how'd you go from the A team to Awakened? Well, Michael, you're talking about. The special forces or the Green Berets yeah. in those times. And those times means um, in times of the Vietnam War. Um, how I went into the special forces was uh, with fear. I didn't know that I was frightened at the time. I was so frightened that, of course, I knew I was frightened of some things like parachuting and like dangerous things, physically dangerous things, but I didn't know at all how frightened I was uh, to not be able to live up to expectations, my own, my parents, others. I didn't know how frightened I was um, not to be loved or even admired or even recognized. There's a street name for fear like this, and it's macho, and that is what I was. And I wanted to be admired. I wanted to be known, um, not known, just acknowledged, recognized as existing. And I thought that becoming a Green Beret would help me. Before that, I would do things like, a, well, I've done a lot of things like treasure hunting, but um, underwater treasure hunting. But that's why I joined the Army. And that's why I became a Green Beret. And that's why... I uh, applied for Vietnam duty. So that's how I got into um, the Special Forces. And that's how I got to Laos, which is where this story in, in Universal Human takes place. The second part of your question is, how did I get from there to where I am now? That's the more interesting part for me, although all of my life is interesting to me. I think Every life is interesting to me because it's a pathway. Yeah. And that path was not predetermined. It unfolded for whoever is walking it. In that case, in this case, it's you. In the case of the people who are listening to us and watching us, it's each of you. And it unfolds choice by choice. But most people don't know what choice they have to make to step onto another life path. Yeah. For example, most people think the choice is like, I'll, I'll move to Colorado, I'll move to Europe, I'll um, change jobs, I'll get an education. Those are all different intentions, but they're actually, you might say, out tensions. They are not life-changing intentions. They are changes of physical activity and experience. 
An intention is a quality of consciousness, a quality of in consciousness that infuses your actions and your words. And in the earth school, which is this domain of experience that spans your birthday to your death day. And in our case, they're overlapping because we're here in the earth school together talking. In that domain, there are only two bedrock, foundational, can't get any deeper intentions, love and fear. So if you're not choosing an intention consciously of love or fear, that means you're choosing an intention unconsciously. And every unconscious intention is a choice of fear. And there are consequences to that, and they're always painful, surprising, in the sense that you say, why did that happen to me? I wouldn't have chosen this. And the consequences of love are constructive, blissful, joyful. So as you learn how to distinguish, in, distinguish within yourself between fear and love and choose love all the time, you are creating authentic power. But how do you do these things? That's what every book that I write and Linda Francis, my spiritual partner, and I have written is about. It's pretty easy to understand. I'm going to explain it thoroughly while we're together, as thoroughly as we have time. But then comes the doing of it. Yes. Then comes the practice. That's where the spiritual rubber meets the spiritual road. So the first part of the spiritual road is to become aware of your emotions. Yeah. Most people are not aware of their emotions. If you are numb, that's emotional ignorance. If you are aware of your emotions to the extent that you can say, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm joyful, I'm depressed, I'm enraged, that's emotional illiteracy. But to become aware of your emotions, emotions in a significant way, you need to put your attention inward into, I'll, I'll give you three areas to start. Your okay, and then I want to I want to back you up and come back to Laos real briefly, but let's first go to those three areas. Anytime you want to shift gears, let me know. I'm still answering the question, how did I get from Laos and the Vietnamese War and a Green Beret? And by the way, there are some other things that I did. Uh, I was addicted to sex. Mm -hmm. I, uh, motorcycles were a big part of my life, mm -hmm. um, drugs. And that was the time that I was describing when I said I was macho. Yeah. I was frightened. I thought I was cool. I thought I was living an admirable, almost perfect life. I didn't realize what I was actually living. Now I do. Yeah. And I wouldn't go back there for anything, but I wouldn't change my past for anything because all of it, every single experience has offered me the opportunity to make changes, which I eventually began to make that has brought me to where I am now. Thank you. So let's go to those three things. Well, there are three tools. Yeah that are used in creating authentic power that you must use if you want to create authentic power. By the way, I, I want to say that uh, to all of our listeners and viewers, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to share a window through which I've come to see life, but I don't ask that you look through it or use it also. Yeah. Specifically, I don't uh, feel that you need to believe or even ask you to I don't ask you to believe anything that I say just because I say it. On the contrary, I suggest that you not, that you, if I say anything that you resonate with, that you experiment with it. And if it produces something good in your life, then experiment some more. And if it doesn't, then throw it away. Don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. And I suggest that you do that in the case of everyone. Don't believe anything that anyone says just because they've got a television show or a book, or a microphone, or a pulpit. Try it for yourself. Be skeptical. 
That's not cynical. It's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Skeptical means, can that really be true? I'm going to see for myself if that's really true, because that would be a big deal if it's true. But I'm not going to believe that it's true until I see it, until I feel it, until I encounter it. That's good. Do that. That's my suggestion. I don't usually give advice, but that is some advice that I guess I am suggesting. So emotional awareness yeah. means that you can experience your emotions in terms of physical sensations in your body. Not, I'm happy, I'm sad. Physical sensations that stab or burn or churn or sting or ache or throb. When you can put your attention in your throat area, your chest area, your solar plexus area, and there's four more areas, but these are the easiest for me to feel physical sensations. Yeah. And you feel any painful physical sensations like these, then you know that fear is active in you. Let's say a frightened part of your personality is active. That's a part that you experience as anger or resentment, jealousy, vengefulness, righteousness, impatience, superiority and entitlement, needing to please and inferiority. And every obsession or compulsion or addiction, all of that is fear. And when you put your attention into these three areas, these three to start, if you feel painful physical sensations, no matter what you think you're feeling, yeah. you're experiencing fear. And if you act on that fear, in other words, if you shout when, you've, when you're angry, if you withdraw emotionally when you're jealous, if you tell people how wrong they are and try to change their lives when you're righteous, that's not you. These are the experiences of parts of your personality. Yeah. And every pers personality has many different parts. And these are the parts that originate in fear, the frightened parts. And when you put your attention in these three areas and you find blissful, good feeling sensations, the kind you want more of, then you know that love is active in you. And when you act on that energy, you create painful, blissful, yes. constructive consequences. Inferiority, superiority, anger, jealousy, all those things. By never acting on that, you avoid the painful consequences that that part of your personality would create. And if you choose instead of challenging that frightened part by not acting on it, if you find yourself in a loving part, such as gratitude, appreciation, caring, patience, awe of the universe, contentment, if you act on any of those, you create constructive, blissful consequences. That means you're developing the ability, you might say, to become a painter. Mm -hmm. And the canvas is your life. And what you put on the canvas are your experiences. And as you create authentic power, you choose the experiences. Imagine you're painting on a canvas that's actually made of canvas. What color are you going to put on there? Where are you going to start? Are you going to put a drab, lifeless, lethargic, or frightening color? Or are you going to put a vibrant color? maybe a primary color, or some beautiful pastels. And the beautiful pastels and the vibrant primary colors and the combinations are the colors you paint with on your canvas that is your life, are the colors that you paint with when you choose to act with love. Authentic power is the ability to distinguish within yourself between love and fear and choose love all the time. So... The question I have, your job, if I understood it right, if I understand what it was, I guess past tense there, was to go in and set up uh, devices where if trucks or convoys or, or, or uh, the enemy, in quotes, would go down certain roads, that someone would come in. I'm trying to say this as 
maybe there is no PC way to put it, is to set up situations so that the enemy didn't live. Absolutely. That's what war is about, Michael. That is exactly what war is about. It is an institutionalized, nationalized use of every resource that a collective has mm -hmm. and focused destructively on what is perceived as an enemy. And this is a microcosm of a microcosm of that. Yeah. One of my top secret missions was with my team to be inserted into Laos in order to plant a motion sensing device by the side of a dirt road, which was part of uh, a network called the Ho Chi Minh Trail that supplied the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army with supplies, with munitions, with food, with fuel. And whenever a truck drove past this sensing device, it sent a signal. And when that signal was received, every when that signal was received, it immediately sent attack aircraft that were standing by for that signal to bomb. And the mission was, you're exactly right, to destroy, to kill. When I was an infantry officer, I became a special forces officer from the infantry. My mission and the mission of the infantry and the essential mission of every military was to close with and kill or capture the enemy. That's the brutality that I used to think in terms of admiration. Yeah. I wanted to be a part of it. I volunteered to be a part of it. But as we become multi-sensory, and we'll get to that, that's an important term. It means our perceptual capability has expanded yeah. considerably. We begin to see our lives from different perspectives, from more expanded perspectives and specifically from the perspective of your soul and you see things like what we're discussing now the stark brutality the question i have then and it's interesting because uh, uh my he's 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 a brother from another mother and he's, he's my assistant who's been in gaza and was hiding under a staircase for 10 days as they were bombing people all around him two weeks ago and when families would get out and try to go to shelter drones would hunt them down and kill them. And, and I think of what the uh, emotional traumas and wounds of everybody, I don't care what border or what anything, we're all one, you, you, you can't, can't convince me otherwise. I, 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 but the emotional trauma and wounds that they go through, but then I've got to think of the emotional trauma and wounds that you went through and as you began to pull on this ball of yarn at some point in your life, I, I've heard sex addiction and fa uh, uh, fast motorcycles. I share the love of motorcycles, although I'm retired from riding them with you. Um, but I'm wondering how you began to pull at that ball of yarn and to be able to heal your heart. Because where you are is, in one sense, it can be an instance. I've, I've had two near-death experiences. I'm sporting all sorts of titanium beautiful parts. We can have an instant moment of satoria, of awakening. But it's, I don't know how to put it, it's still a It's still work. How did you get yourself to do that work? Or what flipped the switch for you? Um, it was incremental on my part. I didn't have a satori. Uh, I had little insights that have been big, been, been big insights in retrospect. I was once uh, from that same time in San Francisco invited to a weekly meeting of physicists at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Yeah. And uh, I was not a physicist. I was a liberal arts major. I didn't like science and I didn't know anything about mathematics so I want to know anything about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my roommate was a physicist, and he got me an invitation, and I went. And these physicists, about 10 or 12 of them, were some renowned, world-renowned physicists. And they were discussing the question, are we creating the reality that we're experimenting with? Now, that was exactly the question that I was discussing with my friends in a coffee shop in North Beach except these were physicists and they were for real. And I happened to be fortunate enough to be at a meeting in which they were discussing qualitatively in language rather than quantitatively in terms of mathematical formalisms. 
I went home immensely excited, but I could not explain what was exciting me. I felt like I had drunk two cups of cappuccino and the sparks were coming off my fingertips, but I couldn't explain why. So I asked if I could come back and they said yes. And I started reading. I went down to the used bookstores in Berkeley because uh, I didn't have much money then at all. And I started buying books that I was drawn to yeah. on physics and quantum quantum physics. And I returned again and again, kept reading and reading, and I slowly began to be able to articulate some of the concepts that were so stimulating, deep. Concepts that brought, in my opinion, the person considering them right up to the boundaries of the intellect in a way that they could actually challenge the hegemony of the intellect. And I decided that I wanted to share what I was learning uh, through a book. And I asked them if they'd help me. And they said they would, all except one of those physicists agreed. And I started sending them pages. And they'd send me back my pages with more notes than I sent them. It was wonderful. And that was the tutorial they gave me and the mentoring they gave me. And so I started to write this book and six months into it, I noticed that the chapters, six chapters I'd written, fit together. But I didn't know how that happened because as soon as I started writing the first chapter, which I outlined, as I outlined all of the chapters in advance, I threw the outline away because my energy and my interest and my enthusiasm shifted to another path. Mm -hmm. And I started writing from that, about that, in that. And six months later, I looked at the six chapters and I realized with genuine surprise that not only did they fit together, they really fit together as though they were designed to fit together. And that, Michael, is when I first realized that I wasn't writing this book alone. And I also realized that I wasn't writing this book alone because it's not possible to be alone. Every co-creation, every creation is a co-creation. And I'd had multi-sensory experiences before. That means experiences beyond the limitations of the five senses, which, by the way, hundreds of millions of us are now beginning to experience. But I didn't know what it was. But this time, I knew. I knew, and I loved it. And I decided that I'm... I set the intention to live my life the way this book was being written, which was spontaneously, intelligently, and joyfully. And I've come a little ways down that road. And that's what I'm sharing in the seat of the soul, in Universal Human, and with you now as we speak. Thank you. So that was part of the process that led me eventually to where I am now. And the path that I discovered in the process of that, by the way, the book I was writing was a book about quantum physics, obviously. But 10 years later, I realized that the book that I was writing was not a sequel to that as I started out to write, but something entirely different, something about reincarnation and the soul and energy and the law of cause, the universal law of cause and effect. And it was called The Seat of the Soul. Yeah. And I published that. And that gave me yet all along the road, there were choice points. And I didn't realize at the time fully that every moment in our lives is a choice point. It's a choice between one of the two foundational intentions in the Earth School. The Earth School, by the way, to be clear, is the domain of time and space and matter and duality. The Earth School, and that includes as far as we can see, with unaided vision or with aided vision, like a radio telescope, or as small as we can see with unaided vision, or as small as we can see, like with a, an electron microscope. All of that is the Earth School. And it's a small part of the universe. Woohoo! 
Yes, that was a, a beautiful thing to see. It was a life changer. And we're all moving into these life changing experiences. And that's really what I want to share with our listeners, that we are now experiencing an epic, unprecedented transformation to human consciousness that has never existed before, or the 2.5 million years of hominoid evolution. Now, that evolution is no longer plodding slowly through time. It's exploding. It's happening with startling velocity. And it's happening to hundreds of millions of people. And within a few generations, this new consciousness will be a part of every human. That's the bigness of what's happening. There's a before and an after. Before was five sensory perception and five sensory humanity, and five sensory humans who felt, knew, and experienced that the limits of the universe were defined by what we could see and taste and hear and touch and smell. And we explored that domain using the intellect, which is designed to work with the five senses. And what it exquisitely does is compare, analyze, evaluate and present us with experiences, the experiences that serve best our survival. That's how we evolved. We survived and we survived by pursuing a specific kind of power. Let me interrupt you for just one brief moment because a word popped into my consciousness, as you said, in that, and, 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 and you were saying our ability to manipulate, which follows along perfectly. The term dissect and even violence comes to mind. Because when we go to the five senses, when we go to a, materials, a, a pure materialist or materialism way of viewing things, it is like the scientist or the doctor who will tear things apart to get at one the answer at the exclusion of the totality of the whole. And I think that that is a, a tearing apart of believing that we are just the five senses rather than an integration, which is the multi-sensory being that you're talking about. Yes, there's none of those exploratory modes that um, extend beyond or will take an individual beyond the domain of the five senses or the limits of the intellect. Within five sensory humanity, power was understood and experienced as ability to control, ability to manipulate. And that was necessary for our survival. Now we are multi-sensory humans. Our perception expands beyond the five senses. We have a sense that we are more than minds and bodies, that the world in which we are living is more than random. Yeah. It's meaningful. That the universe is more than cold and merciless. Maybe it's compassionate and wise. And we have a new understanding and experience of power, which is the alignment of your personality with your soul, which means harmony, with cooperation, with sharing, with reverence for life. This is the new territory. We are standing now with one foot in the old consciousness and one foot in the new consciousness. This is the remarkable characteristic of this point in our evolution. We are the only humans who have ever stood here before. Behind us is the old consciousness. Before us is the new consciousness. Behind us, everyone was in the old consciousness. In front of us, everyone will be in the new consciousness. Now that we are in this period of transition, the question becomes, what will we choose? Yeah. What will we choose in each moment? In each moment of anger, will we choose not to lash out with our words or our fist? That is choosing to respond, to step into the new consciousness, which is multi-sensory perception and power as authentic, alignment of personality and soul. Or will we choose to react with the old consciousness? 
And each time we do, we create consequences for ourselves. And we're becoming aware of all of this. All of this is what we're now becoming aware of, hundreds of millions of us. And it's thrilling. It's also work, as you pointed out. And that's what spiritual development requires. Spiritual, by the way, means of your soul, having to do with your soul. Yeah. So thank you. I want to come back to that term because it is such an important term, an alignment with your personality, with your soul. Actually, the exact word is, yeah, alignment with personality, with your soul. And that is meaning that we're going beyond the five senses to that multi-sensory being. How do we, let's say we're listening to this, let's say that we're struggling, let's say that we're going, there's got to be more, but we haven't been able to traverse that road yet. How do we take ourselves away from this is all there is to this is an infinitesimally small piece of all that is? When I talk about the expanded perception that's now touching so many of us and call it multi-sensory perception because before we had only one sensory system smell, touch, taste, sight, hearing. Now we're getting another one. We're multi-sensory. And that multi-sensory perception changes. It expands our awareness. And we begin to see these things. We don't say as multi-sensory humans, I'm going to expand my awareness right now. I'm going to see myself, as, experience myself as a soul. I'm going to believe. No, that won't go anywhere. But you go far as you begin to be touched by the new consciousness. Now, the new consciousness is a gift from the universe. You don't have to develop it. You can't develop it. Well, we will develop it as we develop cognition. But all you have to do, as with any gift, is unwrap it and use it. This consciousness is now touching probably you, if you're a listener to a podcast like Michael's. Now the question becomes, what are you going to do with your expanded awareness? Which means, what are you going to do with your life? Your personality is not something you can transcend or get rid of. To be alive in the earth school is to have a personality. So, as you begin to see the multisensory, the new consciousness, understanding, an experience of power as alignment of your personality with your soul. That's the same as the alignment of your life with your soul, the alignment of your life with the intentions of your soul. And those, as I've mentioned, are harmony and cooperation and sharing and reverence for life. What are you going to do when you look around you and you see discord and competition and hoarding and exploitation? When you look around you and you see that life is a cheap commodity, what do you do? That question means, what do you do to awaken, when you awaken to yourself as a spiritual person in a world that doesn't yet recognize spirit? But that's not actually true if you think about it, because you're a part of this world and you recognize spirit. So in that context, what are you going to do? That's where responsible choice comes into the picture. A responsible choice is a choice that creates consequences for which you are willing to assume responsibility. Now, I hope the picture has come together. The most significant, the only fundamental and significant choices you make in your life are choices between love and fear. The intention with which you infuse your deed or your word. In other words, the same deed, the same words, can produce very different consequences for you depending upon the intention with which you act or speak in that moment of speech or action. And as you choose that intention of love or fear, you create painful consequences for yourself in the future or joyful. And that's the case for everyone. And that always has been the case. But now we are becoming multi-sensory and we can see it 
for ourselves. We don't need to take it on faith. We don't need to believe it. We can look at our experiences and start to connect the dots between our choices and our experiences. And this is the beginning of the development of mastery. Thank you. It's interesting. Years ago, I was called. You can see behind me a book. Actually, I got a copy over here. Awe, the automatic writing experience. How to turn your journaling into channeling. I was called. I had no plans on it at all to teach people how they can do what you're doing. To go quiet and get in the co-creative process of hearing beyond our five senses and making that connection. Irvin Laszlo, Dr. Irvin Laszlo actually wrote the introduction to it. We are now, I believe, our ability to tune in to something greater, which is our authentic power, which is our true self, is greater now than ever. And I believe, and I'd like you to talk about the micro versus the macro, that when we look around at the world and you talk about it as this being the symptoms of the change, it isn't the change itself. But when we realize that if we dial in on the inside, we now actually can positively, positively affect everything around us. Yes. That's the only way you can positively affect everything around you. Uh, the world that we see around us, the world that we described briefly a little while ago, was built by five sensory humans with external power, for external power, by external power. There is no way to change that world with external power. For example, I could buy, if I had the financial capability, I could buy billboard signs and say to people, look inside, choose love, whatever that means to them. But that's external power. That would be trying to change the world in order to make myself feel better and valuable. Multisensory humans look at their experiences and instead of changing the world when they're feeling a painful emotional experience, they look inside to change themselves. That's creating authentic power. And it's not that our ability to create authentic power is more now than ever before. It hasn't existed before. Because before, we were five sensory. And every talk of soul was either a theological discussion, a philosophical discussion, a speculative discussion. But now when we talk about soul, we can sense something. We sense that we have an immortal aspect, that there is more. When our personality dies, you can look at it this way. When a personality in the Earth School dies, mm -hmm. that happens as its soul decides to return home to non-physical reality. To five sensory humans, death is the ultimate catastrophe. It's the end. It's the end of the story. Multi-sensory humans know that when a soul returns home to physical reality, when it discards an energy tool that it has adapted for an incarnation into the earth school, that neither consciousness nor responsibility comes to an end. Every Buddhist and every Hindu has been taught that. Every Christian has been sort of shown it in terms of heaven and hell because that's what's going to happen based on the choices you make while you are on the earth. The handwriting is on the wall, and, but the experience of it is not a part of five sensory humanity. Now we are becoming multi-sensory. And we can see for ourselves what we formerly had to take on faith. We can see the effects of choosing, consciously choosing love. And by the way, you have to consciously choose love. If you're not choosing consciously, you're choosing fear. So becoming authentically powerful requires emotional awareness, mm -hmm. 
in terms of your body, which will never lie to you. It requires making responsible choices in every moment of anger, jealousy, resentment. Because when you look inward, when you're jealous, for example, and you say, what am I feeling in my chest? And you keep your attention there until you can find a physical sensation. And if it hurts, that's jealousy. That's an experience of the name jealousy. And you know that if you act on it, you'll create destructively. And when you make a responsible choice, just looking inside creates a gap yeah. between the impulse and the action. And in that gap, you can do something that you didn't do before. You can choose consciously the intention with which you will act or speak. And if it's love, then you put yourself on one track. You create constructive consequences. And if it's fear, you put yourself on the opposite track. And by the way, there is no judgment for choosing fear. The universe does not look, or the universe does not, isn't oriented in terms of good or bad or, or better or worse. It's oriented in terms of cause and effect. Every cause creates an effect and every effect has a cause. And if you participate in the cause, you will participate also in the effect. They happen actually at the same time, but in the earth school, sometimes it requires a while before you encounter the effect of your cause but you can count on it coming. That's the universal law of cause and effect, our karma. So actually, Michael, I've wondered a little bit away from what you were asking when we first began this strand. No, this is perfect. And, and I'm actually curious where you are on your path, how you're seeing this shift take place and a book is always, and this is a brilliant work that I want everybody to get. In fact, get one for yourself, get one for a family member. Heck, if you have a child, I would even give it to them because they're actually going to take this information and run with it. But I'm curious, the book is always a snapshot. Where are you now at in your evolution, at your understanding? Because what a crazy, beautiful, horrific challenging, awesome time the last few years have been for the evolution of humanity. And I say for thee, because I believe it's all happening for us and through us, not to us. I agree. However, the first 300,000 years of our evolution were horrendous. They were a constant struggle to survival, mm -hmm. to survive. And the only way to survive is to uh, create external power. But no one saw that as a problem. Of course, there were topic, there were discussions of ethics, discussions of morality, discussions of health, discussions. But this is the way things were. This was understood by all. Power is the ability to manipulate and to control. External power and whoever has more is the boss. Yeah. And the boss always has a boss. Even in religions, sometimes Western religions, Abrahamic religions, the boss goes right up to the top, yeah. which is a projection in my, my experience of our pursuits of external power. And as we're becoming multi-sensory and pursuing authentic power, the short term for that is love, then our projections of divinity are changing because we are changing, and that's our experience. Uh, so it's, it's this awakening that I feel is beautiful. Now, this awakening began, in my experience, about a generation ago, mm -hmm. and will complete itself. That is the transformation from five sensory to multi-sensory. Will complete itself within another few generations. That was the turning point. But also in my experience, the coronavirus pandemic will be seen as a turning point in human behavior and evolution. Yeah. And in fact, there's four chapters on it in Universal Human. Each of them begins the coronavirus miracle. Mm. 
the coronavirus miracle. What does that mean to you? Why? The coronavirus miracle, yeah. the pandemic, the coronavirus miracle, the protest, the coronavirus miracle, the symbol. We could, I could, both of us could talk a lot about the coronavirus, but it's clear to so many people that this mandated pause from a mindless world, a robotically repetitive world of actions and reactions, has now been illuminated by 15 or 16 months of ability to look inside, even if we didn't want to look inside, even if we tried not to look inside yeah. because all we found was anxiety and pain. Still, that has its effect. We begin to see the value of other people, not because of what they can do for us, but because of who they are. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are looking, and I believe it's just about everybody, uh, because just about everybody's been touched by this pandemic. They can see that the steps that are necessary, that were necessary and still are, still are here in the United States, we're getting to a place where we can laugh again. But millions of people are dying, this brutal respiratory death. And not only in India, that's, that's where most people think of India, but in Peru and Brazil and throughout South America, in Africa. So this pandemic is not over. And it's not going to go away as, as most of us would like it to go away. And we can see that the behaviors that are necessary to limit its spread are identical with the behaviors of fear. They are distance, isolation, taking care of yourself. But also we can see that these very same behaviors when undertaken in love change everything. When you were wearing a mask, I still wear a mask sometimes, even though we're inoculated. I don't want to be someone who might be an unaware carrier of this virus and asymptomatic and give it to someone else. So like people have done in Asia for a long time, they wear a mask, not because they have to, but because if they have the flu or they have a cold, they don't want to give it to someone else. Now, when you do that, that's not isolation. That's caring. That's loving. When, when you keep six feet apart from somebody, if you're doing it because you don't want to get something from them, that's not social distance, that's selfish distance. But if you're keeping six feet away because you don't want to harm them, because they're important to you, they're like family, they are family. That's loving distance. So when you're keeping yourself isolated, is that a lockdown or is that a love-in? It's shocking how clear the behaviors that are required to contain the spread of the coronavirus are identical with the behaviors of fear until they are acted upon and utilized with the intention of love. Then everything changes. A love in, loving distance, caring behavior. All of this is part of the gifts of the coronavirus. Um, there's many more and we're all experiencing them. I can learn as much about them from you and from others as they can learn from us, but we can all learn from each other, and we are. That's a cliche, really, but as you become multi-sensory, you experience it, choice by choice, and you begin to realize that every interaction in your life, every circumstance, perfectly serves the spiritual needs of the individuals involved given the wisdom that each has chosen, given the wisdom of the choices that each has made in his or her past. It's an ongoing, awesome miracle. It's a blessing 
over and over and over and over and over again. The blessings don't end. The question is, when will you begin to take advantage of them? When will you become aware of them as blessings? Even the most difficult experiences in your life are blessings. And when you look at your life, as many people who've recovered from cancer or a trauma know that that was a blessing. As you create authentic power, you don't have to wait until you're through it. You can experience it in it, in the moment, in the moment. Because every experience in your life is designed to bring the consciousness of your soul into the awareness of your personality. Many of those experiences are not experiences that the personality would choose. Mm -hmm. But that is their purpose. Everything in the Earth School has that purpose. Well, just, just one thing, when you create authentic power, you are not increasing or decreasing the love in the universe. You can't do that. You are not increasing or decreasing the compassion in the universe or the wisdom of the universe. You are changing, choosing your experiences as you move through the earth school. That's what changes. You change from experiences of fear to experiences of love through your emotional awareness and your responsible choices. You begin to look at your life as an opportunity to learn wisdom through either love and trust or fear and doubt. Love of life, trust in the universe, or fear of everyone around you, everything that's happening, everything that's going to happen, and doubt, doubt that it's ever going to get better, doubt that you can change, doubt that your experiences will ever change for the better. But they can. The only thing that stands between you and the life that's calling to you are choices, are matters of choice, your choice. That's, that's really what I appreciate your giving me the ability to share, Michael. And how you make your choices, that's always up to you. you there's a, countless ways to challenge fear and cultivate love. You can read a psalm. You can walk by a stream. You can chant. You can look at a statue of Krishna. You can smile at someone when the smile comes from your heart. I am enjoying this so much. Part of it is on a con um, excuse me is on a conscious level. But Gary, when I when I started, I talked about raising your your frequency or your vibration. When you are choosing love over fear, there's a palpable change in your frequency, in your vibration, in your makeup, and you are exuding that. And so part of it is I'm consciously taking this in, Gary, and I'm going to recommend everybody replay and replay this, but it just feels good to hear you because you have been doing that work. You have been making those choices. And so there is a, an energy, a frequency about you that makes you a tugboat at a very, I guess it's what the term that you would call authentic power is you are a very powerful tugboat of love right now. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I didn't know if I've ever told anybody that before. You're a tugboat of love, Gary. Well... I like that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I, I can feel your heart when you share that. I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I don't... Can... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am a spiritual partner to those who want to be spiritual partners. Spiritual partner, by the way, uh, spiritual partnership is partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. Uh, and it's not just a couple's dynamic. It exists between individuals and collectives wherever you find yourself 
uh, wanting relationships of more substance and depth yeah. and to connect in more meaningful and real ways. Like just what we're doing now is uh, the beginning of a spiritual partnership. Yeah. Because you can't create authentic power for you, anyone else, and I can either. I can only create it for me and you for you yeah. and each of our listeners for himself or herself, but we can support one another. Not by teaching or preaching or judging, but, well, there's a book called Spiritual Partnership, and that is something that I would really recommend. But we've covered so much ground. What I'd suggest is that you find, ah, you asked me at the beginning of the show, before the show, if I had a meditation yeah. Yeah. that I might give, a short one. I do. Excellent. Before you do that, two last things. Where can people go to find Universal Human, to find all of your work, and to find out more, Gary? You can go to an order page at universalhuman.com. Um, and that is specifically will tell you how to do it. But you can do it anywhere. Uh, you can also go to our, oh, we have a new website. It's the old name, seatofthesoul.com. That's S-E-A-T, like what you sit on, of the S-O-U-L.com. Please go there. It, it's beautiful. And it's just begun. We're putting more and more and more on it every week now. Indefinitely, it's going to, it's going to offer you more support. And our intention is that it be relevant, engaged support. So you can get Universal Human, of course, on our website. You can get it at any bookseller. And you can go to universalhuman.com. Fantastic. Did you have classes as well? Yes. By the way, I am so happy with this. This has just come. I got the first copy two days ago. Wow. I am so fulfilled to share it. And it's on its own now. Sure, I, I show it up like this, but... It's on its own. It's on its own, but it's not. There is so much love and support behind that, Gary. There's so much love and support. It is. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned and I'm learning in my life is trust, relax, do your best, and enjoy yourself. So Universal Human as the book is the best I can do. Actually, all of the books I've written and like Dancing Willie Masters and Seat of the Soul in this book, are the best. I can't do it any better. And now it's into the world. So when I say it's on its own, what I mean is it's a matter of whether I'm attached to what it does or not. Because authentic power is also, you can look at it as developing the ability to move through the earth school with an empowered heart, without attachment to the outcome. Beautiful. That's, that's what I, well, I keep thinking of these wonderful things I'd like to share. <laughs> and I think this could go on for a while, Michael. It's, it's a joy to speak with you. Well, I'm looking for last words of wisdom. So here's your opportunity for one more beautiful thing to share. And then we'll go right into that meditation. How's that? Well, actually, I've been doing that since we've been speaking together. It's not as though I've been waiting for or anticipating a finale or something that's really going to drive the point home. I don't want to drive anything home. I want to make suggestions. I want to suggest that we are in a new consciousness. Many of the things in the new consciousness like reincarnation and responsibility are well known. But never before has the entire human species changed so dramatically and quickly. Never before has human consciousness itself shifted, changed into something different. And the potential that brings is something that we are all going to be exploring for a while. And you know that you're exploring it, the potential of the new consciousness, when it fulfills you 
what you're doing, when it gives you meaning, when you recognize meaning as your compass, meaning always points toward your soul. When you're doing what gives you meaning, you're moving in the direction your soul wants you to move. And you can use that understanding the other way. When your life is filled with meaning, then that's what your soul wants you to do. When your life is emptying of meaning, consider something else <laughs> that, gives you, that gives you meaning. Because you're not rewarded with heaven for creating authentic power. You're rewarded. You're not rewarded. You create authentic power. And with that creation, your creation, come all of the things we've been talking about. Fulfillment, joy, meaning, purpose, vitality, creativity, connection. And if you make choices of fear, if you react in fear, like multi-sensory humans do, we're experimenting in the earth school, mm -hmm. you're not punished. You don't change. It's as simple as that. The responsibility for our evolution is in our hands. And more specifically, the responsibility for your evolution is in your hands alone. And what you do that appears to be self-help, self-change, as you begin to see with your new multisensory perception, is also world-changing. And it's not a matter of becoming the hundredth monkey. It's a matter of realizing that the love and fear in you are the same love and fear in the world. And so when you change the love and fear in you, in that moment, you change the world. That is not evident to five sensory perception, and the intellect goes into riotous objection because it cannot see and five sensory humans cannot experience the intimate relationship, in fact, the identity between inner, inner transformation and external transformation. Yeah. Now, remember, if you will, that I suggest you experiment with whatever you resonate with. Mm -hmm. And if you don't resonate with something, toss it away. But if you did and you didn't recognize it, it will come back to you at some time in a helpful, constructive way. And if that particular thing doesn't, everything else in your life will continue to come towards you, to you, in you, in a healthy and constructive way. And your experience of it will depend entirely on how you hold it. This has been so beautiful, Gary. i got to wrap things up by doing a meditation here, but, but thank you. It's not strong enough a word, but thank you. And I've had, uh, oh, geez, 1,500, 1,600 guests on the show. Thank you. You have bring such a a sweetness, such a. I'm a, a fairly woo woo guy, so I'll go with attunement. You have brought such an attunement to people today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I think a lot about that word too. What am I attuned to right now in this moment? Am I attuned to love? Am I attuned to fear? Well, here's a meditation. Consider it a talking meditation. Because greeting authentic power is a lifelong meditation. But here's a little talking meditation. So you can continue to watch the screen, but I'd suggest that you sit up straight and close your eyes and take a deep breath and let it out. And the purpose of that is to relax yourself a little bit, to release any tension you might be feeling, to release any tension that you might not be feeling. And to enjoy how clear and sharp your mind has become and always does become as you relax, really relax.
Allow yourself to easily, effortlessly review, not actively review, but to allow what you have heard in the talk that Michael and I have had. Come to you. Let anything that you resonate with or have resonated with to come into your awareness now. Anything that we discussed, any particular words that we said, allow them to come to you now. There may be one that stands out. There may be many. Don't worry about remembering them all. If there's a lot, you will be able to remember them when this meditation concludes. Now, of all of those things that you resonated with, or did you resonate with it and push it away? Did you dismiss it as impossible? If it were really impossible, why did you continue to listen? That's resonance too. So anything that stands out for you, let that come to you, make a note of it, and then begin to ask yourself, why did this stand out for me? Of all the many things that Michael and Gary discussed, why this? Why these things? Not an intellectual inquiry, but with this orientation. What does this have to do with me? What does my awareness of this, among all the things that I could have, that could have been brought to my attention, why <coughs> is this important enough for my awareness to bring it to my attention? And then listen for an answer. It may not come immediately. It will come at the appropriate time. Imagine now that you have asked that question, that the answer is pouring in. Ask yourself that question now. What can I learn about myself from what my awareness has brought to my attention? How does it apply to my life, to the people I'm interacting with, to the things I'm doing, to my challenges and to my joys? Now take another breath, and as you let it out, let yourself return to where you're sitting. And as you take another deep breath and let it out, gently open your eyes, gently. See where you are again. Oh, maybe you'll see the screen again. Or see Gary again. What else did you see? Yes. What else did you see besides these small pictures? These small pictures are not miracles of the internet. They are reminders of the miracle of how connected we are all the time. That's what the internet symbolizes for multi-sensory humans in the Earth school. What do our other collective experiences symbolize for you? those that you can see as the most constructive, positive, grounded, sane symbols. Look for those symbols and know when you find them that you found something in you that's valuable and worthy of your attention and your cultivation. Wow. 
Gary, this has been phenomenal. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. I gotta get my energy back up. I'm in a glowing, warm, loving, just special sacred place. I cannot thank you enough, Gary. You're welcome, Michael, and thank you for inviting me so that I can share with your extended family who is listening to us. That is an honor. It goes both ways. Got to crank it back up for the finish here. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the universal human and begin elevating your frequency and discovering your authentic power today and shine bright. Woohoo! I love this interview. I recommend listening to it again and again. On that note, if you want to dive into your soul, if you want to hear the deepest words from your inner wisdom, and you want to be able to put pen to paper and ask questions of the universe, where am I going? What am I doing? How do I make a difference? Then I cannot recommend enough getting off the automatic writing experience, a process that teaches you how to go into your soul, to write to spirit, to write to the divine, to write to your inner wisdom and say, what do I do from here? What do I need to know? Who am I? You can get it at Amazon. Please ask for it at your local retailer. I want to support the local stores, no matter what, above and beyond all else. And you can find our program, video-based program and live classes at automaticwriting.com. So to check out more incredible shows, click here, subscribe below. Be sure to click on that bell icon to be notified of shows, upcoming premieres, and live events every Sunday night with me. Big thumbs up if you like to share with the world and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys. <laughs>